All right, everyone. Uh, I'm showing three o'clock, so I think I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get started here this afternoon. Uh, so welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here for day two of the Capital District Clean Communities Municipal EV Readiness Workshop. Um, I think I see some uh, some repeat uh, customers here in the participant uh, window, so that's great. I uh, just want to remind everyone today that the webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the Capital District Clean Communities Coalition website, uh, hopefully early next week. Um, I should get today's presentations and uh, yesterday's presentations up. Um, also want to remind everyone that the uh, question and answer box uh, on the, the Zoom function bar um, can be used to, to enter any questions that you have uh, in today's presentation. Um, uh, I'll moderate those and read those back to the uh, presenters at the end of each presentation. Um, if you're just joining us today and, and weren't here yesterday, I wanted to kind of go over and, and thank yesterday's presenters and highlight them as well um, in case anybody was looking to go back on to yesterday's webinar. Uh, yesterday we had presentations from Jill Hank from the Capital District Regional Planning Commission um, and she gave a presentation on their Clean Energy Communities Program which provides um, uh, incentives and coordination with uh, municipalities on um, uh, sustainable options and, and uh, electric vehicle fleets as well. Um, our second presenter yesterday was Amina Hassan from WXY Architecture, uh, who went over some best practices on uh, municipal EV planning and policy decisions. And our third presenter yesterday was Ron Semp from Plug-in Stations Online, um, an EVSE installer in the region. Um, and Ron went over some uh, some keys to streamlining the, the EVSE permitting process uh, for municipalities to um, help make it easier for developers to install uh, charging infrastructure uh, on new development. Uh, today we're going to have presentations from Jeff Flagg from the City of Glens Falls to go over a, a local perspective on installing municipal uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, charging infrastructure. Uh, a presentation from Ryan Backley from ChargePoint on uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure networking options. So once you have the stations in the ground, what are the options uh, uh, for charging for electricity and, and linking the units together um, and networking. Um, and then our third and final present today, presentation today will be from Jason Zimbler of NYSERDA uh, to go over uh, the current zero emission vehicle incentives in the state. Um, so with that, uh, Jeff, if you wanna share your screen, uh, so our first presentation here will be from Jeff Flagg and Jeff is currently the sustainability coordinator for the city of Glens Falls where he has led the city's efforts on several climate-based initiatives including the development of a community microgrid, attainment of NYSERDA's clean energy community status, receipt of a DEC Climate Smart Communities grant to develop greenhouse gas inventories and create a citywide climate action plan and more recently an Empire State Development Grant to build an urban agriculture pilot in downtown Glens Falls. From 1999 to 2016, Jeff was a program director for the Sagamore Institute, a center for ecological education whose mission centers around various land use issues, including energy use, smart growth, and ecosystemic balance. Dr. Flagg earned his bachelor degree in marketing and a master's in literature and doctorate in American culture at Bowling Green University. His academic research focuses on the evolution of land ethics, and he has more than 20 years of university teaching experience, both here and abroad, having spent two separate years teaching at universities in China. So thank you for being here this afternoon, Jeff, and it's all yours. Okay, uh, I'm assuming you can see that okay and hear me okay. Yeah. Everything looks great. Um, well, thanks, Jacob. As Jacob said, you know, I've been working with the city of Glens Falls for about uh, five years as a sustainability coordinator. Um, and I, I guess I should sort of preface it by saying that, you know, one of the municipal considerations is sort of centered around, you know, how um, amenable your city is. And we've been very fortunate in, uh, in Glens Falls to have a, a very progressive mayor and city council who not only 
you know, want to move the city forward, but also seem to work very well together. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I could say they sit around, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, but they certainly have a great sort of mutual interest in sort of uh, uh, progressing the city, especially sort of setting ourselves up as a, um, you know, sort of a gateway to the Adirondacks and, you know, EVSC and things like that are certainly compatible with that. Um, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll start with sort of suggesting if you take nothing else from this uh, short presentation that you, you know, at least consider, you know, I'm probably not an expert uh, on this. In fact, one of the things I've discovered uh, a little bit to my chagrin is that <laughs> there aren't really any experts in sort of, you know, establishing municipal considerations for this kind of stuff. Um, what, I, what I hope you can take from this is not that I'm going to provide you with any answers, but that I can at least give you the kinds of questions uh, that you probably want to ask before you, you know, engage in a project like this. Uh, you know, it, it sounds simplistic to say we're going to put in charging stations so people can, you know, you know, plug their cars in and charge their electric cars up. But there's a lot of things you have to sort of think about, you know, um, and primary among them is, you know, who's going to be using these. And when you start, you know, uh, segmenting, you know, your, your population, including visitors, you know, into different groups, it becomes a little bit harder to sort of figure out who's going to be using them, when, uh, for how long, how much are they willing to pay, um, are they willing to pay anything? Um, you know, when are they going to be using these? All these kind of things are, are important, you know, and, and there's no one size fits all answer. We've got, you know, Glens Falls is, is a pretty small city. You know, we're only four square miles, you know, two by two. So, uh, you know, what is appropriate and useful for Glens Falls is not going to be necessarily appropriate and useful for places that are more dense, more, you know, spread out. Um, you know, have more people living downtown or, you know, more, more um, um, suburban neighborhoods. There's all sorts of different considerations. So hopefully um, I can at the very least get you start to start thinking, uh, you know, assuming that your community is looking at installing uh, some, some equipment, um, that you're started looking at, the, at the, the right questions, I guess. So what I'm going to sort of cover here in the course of the next 20 or 25 minutes is really uh, the sort of the basic questions that you might sort of be thinking of on your own, which is, you know, where are we going to put these? Uh, and I mean that in specifics. You know, you really have to start thinking long and hard about um, where, especially when you're talking about municipalities, because in many cases you have a lot more options. If you're a business, you know, you put it in your parking lot. If you're a homeowner, you put it in your garage or on your wall or whatever. Um, you know, when you're a municipality, you have, you know, lots of different properties um, that are potentially uh, locations for this. Um, in addition to that, you know, what kind of equipment are you going to put in? And I won't go into great detail there. Other presenters have or will talk more about that. But it's worth thinking about um, from a municipal perspective, you know, what kinds of, of users you're really trying to cater to. Uh, and it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, obviously, there's the, there's the cost considerations, and that's become, you know, a much bigger concern in the, in the post-COVID world, right, where uh, budgets are always strained. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, funding out there. I mean, so the, in some cases, the cost should not be an impediment at all. Um, in other cases, you know, some of the things, the longer term costs, you really do have to look at uh, a little more closely because, you know, despite, you know, even if you can get the upfront uh, costs largely covered, uh, which we have in, in the now two projects we've done, um, you still have some ongoing costs that you really need to, to deal with. Um, on the other side of that, of course, the flip side is that you do have some, some pricing issues and some revenue issues, uh, and you can sort of recover a lot of these costs. And in many ways, it's sort of a benefit. Um, you know, uh, electric charging stations are, are good in that they're sort of like, um, uh, sort of like lotteries, you know, in the sense that it's, it's revenue, but it's all uh, voluntary, right? Nobody's forced to sort of charge their car. You want them to get to do it because they actually are, are getting a service that they appreciate and benefit from. Uh, and then finally, a last piece, sort of putting all this together, you know, we're in the process now of sort of engaging uh, the public and, and various constituencies to try and figure out the ways that we can sort of maximize the utility of this. Uh, just to, to recant real quickly, uh, we have really engaged in two separate projects um, for, for charging station infrastructure. The first was just about three years ago in 2017, we put in three stations, six ports, uh, dual port stations um, in, our, in one of our municipal parking garages. And then just in April, we followed that up with another 10 stations or 20 ports 
um, at locations all around the city. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, and, and how we sort of came up with those. So, you know, as I talk about sort of locations and, and the suitability of various venues and locations to put these, this equipment, um, it's, it's worth understanding uh, where, by and large, where people charge their cars now. Um, and the, the current breakdown, I need to find the source for this because I saw it in a study recently. Um, but the, the most recent breakdown that I saw was that currently about 80% of all charging is done at home, right? Uh, and another 12% is done at 12 is done at people's workplaces. So that's over 90% of all the charging, which means that if you're a municipality, you're really sort of trying to fit the, that other 8%, you know, whatever that is, whether it's people going to restaurants, whether it's people visiting, you know, uh, hospitals or public places or going to museums, uh, you know, or in some cases, you might be looking at people who are residences who live downtown, right? So there might be a segment of that 80% that you want to cater to. Uh, you know, we're really engaged in uh, a, a pretty vigorous sort of downtown revitalization effort. And part of that is getting people to move back downtown. Well, if they're going to move downtown and they want a, uh, an EV, they're going to have to have a place, a residence, so to speak, where they can get that um, recharged. Uh, and in the same situation with workplace, right? Many people, uh, this, the, the parking garage I was referring to um, that we put our first ones in is largely used by the, 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 the regional hospital that's right next door, Glens Falls Hospital. And so many of the people who seem to be charging there are workers at the hospital. Um, but as I say, it, it's, it's worth knowing um, you know, who the people are that are going to be using this. And that's important because in some ways you need to sort of cater what you're going to come up with as equipment to the people that are going to be using it or the people that you anticipate are going to be using it. Uh, as we've gone through the process here in Glens Falls, we've sort of identified, uh, you know, three sort of groups of users and they sort of in many ways correspond to the time periods uh, and to some extent to the equipment that's available, the levels of equipment. And I'll touch on that very briefly in a minute. Um, you know, so you're looking at people from our perspective in Glens Falls, you know, we're, we're just on the edge of the Adirondacks, about a mile off the North Way. You know, there's a group of users who are coming, um, who may be coming downtown, you know, just to go to our, our farmer's market or going to do to pick up some quick shopping before they head up to camping in the Adirondacks or maybe stopping for a quick snack or something along those lines. You know, they're going to be there maybe under an hour. Uh, we've got other people who are coming for longer periods. Uh, there's events at the Civic Center downtown. We've got uh, you know, concerts. We have several theaters, uh, people coming for dinner. They might be there for a few hours, you know, one, two, three hours maybe. And then of course you've got this, what what's, turns out to be a pretty large group, relatively speaking, which is longer term users again, who are there either because they live downtown um, in, in apartments and you know, park somewhere in the, in the public areas um, or there are people who work at various businesses down there. So, you know, you, you, you take this group of people, try and figure out who's charging when, and then you sort of take an inventory of what spaces you have available to you. Um, you know, in, in sort of priority of desirability, you sort of have street parking where people can, you know, park right next to where the businesses are and how wonderful they can charge there. Um, then you've got parking lots that are, you know, in our city certainly less convenient than, than on the street but still, you know, more convenient than the couple parking garages we have, which are sort of, you know, on the edge of town, you know, a few, a few blocks walk anyway. Um, one of the things you find, of course, is that in many ways, uh, these more convenient spaces uh, are more expensive, right? The, the infrastructure building you have to do, for example, in some cases, the equipment you want to put in is more expensive if you're going to put a, a, you know, like a pedestal uh, charger on the street than it is if you're going to put something in a parking garage where you doesn't have to worry as much about the weather. You maybe you can put a wall-mounted system uh, instead of a, a, a bollard system, so you don't have to. You, know, you save some costs there, and that's something that I'll mention uh, in just a minute. So this idea of where you're going to put these is an important consideration uh, because you know people. You know the only thing worse than having uh, you know charging stations that people resent because there's other people getting these wonderful locations is when they're not being used at all. And then, you know, residents and, and, and citizens are justifiably irritated, you know, when their municipal officials have, you know, squandered all this money on things that aren't being used. And that's what I'm sort of referring to in that last uh, uh, item there, saying the choice of parking spots in these locations. You know, one of the things that, that, that we've tried to do when we've looked at 
well, let's say parking areas, municipal parking lots, for example, is where are the two worst spots in this parking lot where that we can put a charging station? And the reason for, for thinking that way is because uh, you don't want to put these in places where people who don't have EVs are going to resent them. Uh, most EV users, if you're looking at a parking lot, they don't care if they have to walk to the back of the parking lot uh, to charge their car. Um, too often, what I've seen is that uh, municipalities will put these, you know, right next to, let's say, the handicap spots, the most, you know, accessible spots in the lot, which they need to be when you're, you know, when you're considering, um, you know, handicapped accessible spaces. Uh, they don't need to be when you're putting uh, charging stations in. Sometimes it's dictated by the, uh, you know, the infrastructure that you have in Harper, you have to dig to a, uh, to a line. But in many cases, you know, my thinking is, uh, our thinking is in Glens Falls, you know, if, if we've got 100 spaces, I want to put this charging spot or the charging uh, equipment in the 99th and 100th uh, best spots. That way, no one's going to resent the fact that these two spaces are, are being uh, earmarked. Uh, and if anybody does use them who doesn't have an EV, uh, what they call uh, getting iced out, you know, your internal combustion engine car parking in an EV spot. If they do take those spots, it's only going to be because the first 98 are already taken. Uh, at that point, you've got a, a different problem to deal with. So it's worth thinking you know, carefully about where you put them in the city and also within the, the places you're looking at um, in the city. I won't go into the, the, this, um, you, as I said, you'll either have or have, will have um, much more information from others uh, on these presentations, or, uh, or Ryan among others, as experts than I. But I only mentioned it as a way of, of, of sort of uh, matching the, the types of equipment you're going to have to the people who are using them uh, and when they're going to be using them. Uh, you know, the, the level ones can only put about five or six miles in an hour. Um, but in many cases, that's all you need, right? I mean, if you're talking about somebody who's looking at a, uh, 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 you know, somebody who's working or living downtown, you know, they either don't want to, or in many cases, you know, if we have hospital workers, they can't go, you know, if, if their car is charged and you're, and you're making them pay to just sit there, they can't really do that. Um, on the other hand, it might well be possible to put in level one stations for people who want to have, you know, slow charging. In many cases, you know, the equivalent of sort of trickle charging for old uh, deep cell batteries where, you know, it's, it's much less stressful on the battery if you sort of, you know, uh, add slower or lower voltage. Uh, so, you know, for people who want to stay there for long periods, level one can be fine. Uh, level two is, is what most uh, public charging stations, all of ours are at this point, um, our level two stations. And then of course you have what's become a little bit more popular is level three stations, which can get you a lot of range in a relatively short time. Uh, you know, you need a pretty significant infrastructure to accommodate those in any kind of numbers. Um, the other issue of course is that they're expensive. Uh, and you have to figure, you know, these are trying to sort of replicate uh, a filling station, right? You know, where you can get a lot in a, in a very short time. Um, so, you know, the, the, how long people are gonna be there uh, and, you know, how quickly they want to get out is a real consideration. And, you know, something that, you know, you sort of juggle a little bit uh, at a municipal level. When you talk about costs, there's really three different buckets, I suppose, um, of costs to consider. Uh, two of them are related. They're, you know, putting them in. And, you know, the first one is, you know, just the cost of, of the equipment itself and how much it costs to put it all in. Uh, as I mentioned, almost all... Uh, you know, I, I would say the vast, vast majority, and some of these other folks can take me to task if I'm wrong, but the vast majority of equipment being put in these days is level two. There is a lot of support out there um, for, for installation and equipment and for construction and make ready costs. Um, you know, the, 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 the first category there varies a lot less than the second, mainly because the second one depends on where you're going to put these. Uh, you know, the make ready costs you're going to have and how much digging and trenching and upgrades of electrical facilities you're going to have um, is largely dependent. Just to give you one example, uh, we've had a difficult time putting on-street chargers in downtown locations in Glens Falls because we have what's called a, a secondary network. And that's a, our, our power lines downtown are all buried and we have sort of pedestal, um, you know, post um, light, light uh, street lamps. They look wonderful. Um, they're very convenient, you know, you don't see any overhang lines, but it means that you're sort of limited in where you can put things like EVSE because you have to, you know, if you want to put them too far away from where we have our sort of um, uh, 
or transfer stations or junction boxes or whatever we call them in the sidewalk um, that come out of the, of the, you know, of the ground, uh, if they're not close to those, it's really expensive. Uh, so we're a little bit hamstrung in, you know, having to put them relatively close, unless, of course, you want to pay, you know, an arm and leg to make it happen. And uh, there is funding available from, in our case, from National Grid. Uh, if you're in the National Grid um, um, utility area, uh, there's quite a bit of funding, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then, you know, as far as cost of operation, uh, the ongoing cost, you know, it's, it's worth not forgetting these ongoing costs, right? Because uh, they're the ones that are going to be lingering with you. I just met with our mayor this morning. And, you know, the biggest single ongoing cost that, that I can see right now is actually not the cost of electricity. It's the networking costs. You know, and if you flip those, uh, I probably should have flipped those two uh, in order of, of, of priorities because, uh, you know, I mean, it's, you're, we're looking at around $330 per port per year, right? So you're talking about a, a given dual port station is going to cost you about six six fifty in in um, just networking cost. Now it's not without value to have these, right? I mean, the networking and that's how that's the whole brains of the operation tells people where they are and tells them how much they are, tells them how they're charging. Um, you know, it's it's a useful, certainly useful to be networked, um, but it's not an insignificant cost either, and something you have to sort of keep in mind as you move forward and you add more and more and more um, uh, stations. Uh, and then, of course, um, you have maintenance and repairs. I put an asterisk there simply because, uh, you know, thus far, the, the stations that we put in, including these three-year-old ones, we really haven't had any maintenance or repairs. Uh, we did have one cable that was bad in one of them. Um, I think ChargePoint and plug-in stations actually did ours. Uh, they actually did it even out of warranty. They came up and, and did that, um, fixed that for us. Uh, we've had a few little software glitches, but nothing to speak of. So. I can't really speak to, you know, how much your budget for that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of these manufacturers do offer some, um, you know, warranty and long-term care things. But, you know, you've got to, I guess if you can afford that, um, it's maybe worth getting. I'm showing you here just a quick example of what we did in our most recent project, which I mentioned was putting 10 stations, dual port stations at eight locations around the city. And you can see just from this pie chart, how little we had to pay. And, and we were very close at one point, but for a few decisions the city made for where we wanted to put a couple of these, um, which made the equipment more expensive because we were going to use some unnetworked stations uh, in our DPW. We decided to make them for the public outside. Uh, we would have actually been at zero or less. Uh, and <laughs> when I say less, the reason is because the way the funding works for NYSERDA is that they will fund, as you can see there, uh, $4,000 a port or $8,000 per station for the equipment and the installation. Uh, and I believe that's a flat amount. So if you can somehow figure out a way to make it cost less than that, you actually can come out ahead. <laughs> and uh, I think when we first budgeted this out, we were something, our, our total budget was something like negative $738. Um, the national grid support is even more, although it's an up to level of support. They'll give you up to $10,000 a station uh, but it's, it's up to that amount. You can't come out ahead if it costs less. Uh, and in many cases, I think they either do the work themselves or they'll just pay the contractor directly. So we, as the municipality, we didn't even have to deal with, with that level uh, or that, that part of the support. Uh, and I also believe, and I, I, at least it was for us, is that you know, if you're going to combine stations, you know, combine locations, you can use a, a low cost at one to make up for a higher cost at another location. right? So they're going to give you if they're giving you ten thousand dollars a station, if one of them costs twelve and one of them costs eight, you're still going to wash out, even though the one was more than the, 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 the per port they're given. So that's something to keep in mind too, and it was one of our considerations as we sort of went forward with the uh, uh, the plan. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this either. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe Ryan's going to talk a little bit more about this, but you know, just uh, as you're considering as a municipality you know, how to sort of recover some of these costs, there's a number of different ways. And I, I can't speak for all the manufacturers, but I do know that some of these manufacturers are really flexible and they have all sorts of different ways you can do this. The software, you know, in many cases, these are just, um, you know, they're software machines more than they are electricity distribution machines uh, and, and, and very smart technology. So, you know, you can do it by just charging for the kilowatt hour. Uh, you can do it by charging for time. Uh, you can do it by, you know, charging people to, you know, once they've 
filled their car, I'm saying pay for popularity. Once your car is fully charged, you can then charge a fee to stay there after it's charged, um, or you can come up with some sort of combination of all these. Uh, you know, we're, the, we're sort of looking at, we haven't charged yet, we're sort of looking at the first one. Uh, the, the one problem I have personally with the second option that pay for time is that it's worth recognizing, and, and most people, <laughs> many car owners it seems don't understand this either, is that you know there are two components to how fast your car charges. One is the equipment and one is your car. The actual charger is in your car, not in the equipment. So I have, for example, a smart, uh, you know, a little, little Mercedes built smart uh, that charges at a relatively low rate, mainly because it doesn't, um, you know, it's, it only has about an 80 mile range. Well, if, if I go and go to a by the hour charge, uh, a Tesla or a Bolt and probably charge maybe 25 miles in an hour, 26, I can charge about 13. So if we're both paying $1.50 an hour, they're getting twice as much electricity in that hour as I can load onto my car. So you can imagine how, you know, how people, people would say if, you know, if your gas pump, <laughs> if that gas pump worked at, at half the rate, but still had to charge the same. So, you know, it's, it's a little simpler in many ways, but it's a, it's a little tough, um, you know, trying to, um, trying to sort of create the fairness principle there. Um, and as I say in that last sort of recreative um, uh, column there, uh, you can do all sorts of things. You can give separate rates for different groups of people. Uh, you, can, you can have rates for you know, zip codes. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. You can give overnight rates. You know, that's really what we're trying to do now is to come up with uh, you, recognizing that there's probably not a one size fits all solution. We're really trying to see if there's a way that we can come up with um, something that works for everybody. And that may be you know, doing things that are gonna be uh, a little bit more creative, take a little bit more time, quite frankly, um, but I think, as I said earlier, you know, it's, uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's, it's not as simple as it sounds. And so I think it, it takes some time. And the one thing you don't want to do is to sort of rush into these things without really giving uh, a lot of consideration to a lot of these, um, uh, these factors. Uh, and then finally, just, uh, you know, to, to look at how, you know, once you have them in, how do you sort of make sure that the public is aware of them? You have the support of the public. Um, you know, one of the things we've started with, of course, is, you know, the public, the, the, the municipality itself, right? Uh, the, the, the city has a lot more, I don't want to say control, that's probably not the right word to use, right? But influence over its own employees, right? As employees, you can offer them, you know, incentives to buy electric vehicles, for example. You could make uh, discounted rates on public charging, uh, you know, part of a fringe benefit uh, for anybody who buys them. So there are different ways you could sort of get you know, your internal um, team, if you will, involved in the process. And then, of course, you got to go outside, right? The public are really the ones you got to get to buy into the process. Um, you know, we've done it by having, you know, <clears throat> setting up, you know, little ribbon cutting sounds a little elaborate, but having, you know, some sort of an opening ceremony, mentioning these things, uh, bringing, uh, you know, local media, we've had the newspapers uh, talking about these things, uh, you know, taking photographs, showing people charging their cars, it doesn't have to be anything large. It's just to make people aware. To be totally honest with you, most EV owners, you know, especially if they have, you know, an app somewhere that tells them, they're going to find out pretty quickly where you have these uh, stations available to you. Uh, but this kind of awareness, you know, is sort of an ongoing process. And, you know, it's, these are not massive projects. So a lot of times they can go sort of unseen. And really, it's sort of important. In the case of uh, you know, that last bullet I have under number two, uh, you know, National Grid not only provides some PR support, uh, but also <laughs> if they're funding any of the project through their make ready costs, require you to, to do these things, which makes perfect sense, right? They're, they're trying to make sure that your, their investment is, uh, you know, is well supported and that the, the municipality and the community are as engaged as they can be and know about all the benefits of that. Um, and then finally, something that we're just starting now is to engage the, the business community and you can do that through things like, you know, uh, partnerships with individual um, facilities. You know, we're, we're, we're talking right now with some restaurants that have delivery vehicles and suggesting that if they got an EV, you could actually come up with a scheme where they could reserve a space, uh, you know, a, a, a port, um, say overnight, where you might have some opportunity, you know, uh, the pizza delivery guy every night from 12 to 8, that particular port only works for that business. Uh, and they can go in there and they can use it. 
and they can make some commitment to paying, right, that can help you sort of recover some of these costs at a time when most people might not be using them. Uh, and then they know they also are going to have you know, the ability to charge. And then finally, uh, you know, you can come up with some promotions whereby local businesses, perhaps, you know, if they want to come up with a, a way to credit the, uh, you know, the, the EV charger for the time they spend at the restaurant or, you know, at a concert or something like that, there are different ways that you can sort of use uh, these as a um, sort of a promotional, I don't want to say giveaway, but a promotional opportunity for the community to also, you know, um, uh, demonstrate your, your sort of uh, environmental bona fides uh, as a municipality. So these are the different um, the, the sort of perspectives, I think, that I've uh, sort of developed over the, the last couple of years. As I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, uh, I'm, but I've, having sort of rummaged around for information on a lot of these questions, I'm starting to think I should just go become a consultant on municipal EV installation because I can't find any information anywhere. So uh, I, I guess I'm probably <laughs> as, as, as good as anybody at this point. Uh, you can see now that I, uh, I'm, I'm going to open up, haha, uh, excuse the pun there, the last slide, I'm going to open up to any questions that anybody might have. Um, you can also <coughs> feel free to contact me anytime you like. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now in the, in the question pod, but uh, maybe some will pop up. I mean, I've got uh, at least one here, maybe, maybe a couple more if, um, so, I mean, I know you mentioned that you haven't really had many maintenance issues, even on some of your chargers that have been in for a couple of years. Um, I mean, I know in some of the discussions that we've had uh, with some of the coalition members, it, it comes up pretty often that there's uh, disabled chargers, you know, whether it was snow or ice or misuse that, you know, put them down. Um, did you guys like look into you know, putting them somewhere that's somewhat out of the weather when you install them or really you just have had good luck with, yeah. uh, with the maintenance side of things? Great question. You know, the first ones we put in, as I mentioned, we put in three different levels of a park, parking garage, a five-level parking garage. So essentially they're on the second, third, and fourth level right above each other. And the reason we did that, when we built the parking garage, I was told by the local economic development guy that it had been sort of pre-designed for uh, for EV chargers. The problem was where they built all the conduit and all the <laughs> was in bad locations. They were just what I was talking about. They were the best locations in the park on, on the first uh, level. On the outside where, you know, the open gaps between the levels would have snow and wind and rain coming in. You know, they were in the way for plows. So we actually, when we worked with plug-in stations online, they, the, the, the fellow there, John Duran, who owns the company, he actually came and said, listen, it will save you money and it'll be better for the equipment if you put them in this interior wall on different levels, right? Because, you know, the, the, I'm sure the thinking at the time was um, put them where people can see them as if people find out where charging stations are by driving by and looking for one. Um, everybody who has a, a, an EV knows you find it by looking at your app and saying, where's one that's open? So, you know, everybody knows where they are now. They drive up to the second level, or the third level, or the fourth level, and they find those there. And they're much out of, you know, they're, because they're out of the weather, we haven't had any problems with them. Um, I, I can't speak to the outdoor ones that we now have a lot of, right? Because you know, they're only a few months old and we haven't had any bad, any, uh, they haven't had a winter yet, for one thing. Right. Um, and we have tried to keep them, you know, certain things like plows, right? Making sure that they're not going to be in the way of, of getting hit by snow plows or the snow that the snow plows are going to move. But um, yeah, I can't quite speak to that. I'll have to give you an update in a year. Yeah. But I mean, it definitely sounds like that, that did go into the, you know, it's, it's in your mind when you're placing them, right. Is, is keeping them out of the weather as much as possible. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I still don't, I don't have any other questions. Um, well, I'll, I'll hang on. So as you go through, if anybody comes up with any, again, I, I assume you're still looking at my uh, contact information there. So I can throw you my screen back, but I'll, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to reach out. Yeah, definitely. Um, and right, if anybody, um, you know, you can also reach out to me with any questions after, after the presentation and I can forward them along to any of our presenters as well. Um, so with that, I guess um, we can move on to our next presenter, Ryan Backley from ChargePoint. 
Um, Ryan, if you want to share your screen and, and uh, pop online. Um, so Ryan is, uh, as I mentioned, works for ChargePoint. Uh, he's been working uh, with commercial, institutional, and industrial organizations for over 10 years to deploy green technologies and sustainable strategies across their facilities. And Ryan is currently a director of sales at ChargePoint. And for the past five years, has worked with organizations to develop effective, scalable, and EV charging solutions. So, Ryan, if uh, you want to go ahead, it's all yours. All right, great. All right, thank you, Jacob. And, uh, and Jeff, that, that was great. You say you're not an expert, but uh, you, you did a great job there. So. Certainly sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember when we first met about three years ago or so. So uh, definitely come a long way, and uh, yeah, the consultant thing might be an opportunity there. <laughs> um, so anyway, so to get into what I'm going to cover today, so I am going to touch, um, you know, on a market overview. Uh, some of there's a lot happening, obviously, in this in this space, um, and I'll keep it specific to what's going on in New York. Um, review some things there. Um, planning considerations. So as you are looking to develop um, an EV program um, across your municipality, kind of just touching on some things that. To consider. Uh, Jeff touched on some of it, so I'll try and not make it redundant and uh, touch on some other points. Um, review EV charging solutions and some options to consider, and then you know have some questions at the end. So just uh, just one quick slide here on ChargePoint for those that may not be familiar with us. Uh, we were founded in 2007, actually invented the network charging station back then. Um, and have grown um, to be a significant, you know, about 75, 80% market share, um, not just in New York, but across the, across the country, growing to over 120,000 charging ports um, across the globe, which we're really excited about. Um, and we're about 750 employees and, and half of those being, you know, on the engineer software development side. So a unique, th unique thing about ChargePoint is not only do we manufacture you know, our hardware, uh, we're vertically integrated. So we also develop our own, you know, network software components as well as the ongoing maintenance and support. So from a market standpoint, I'm sure you're hearing a lot of buzz of what's going on um, in this space. You know, some of the projections are, are really, really exciting. You know, with 60 million vehicles being projected in 2040, um, you know, 55% of the light duty fleet market. And this is again, just some, a study done on, on the light duty vehicles, your cars and such, but there's so many other buses, trucks, all this stuff in the, in the fleet space. So it's a really exciting time. Um, a lot of that has to do with the, you know, the, with the, the auto manufacturers. Many of them have some very um, impressive goals by 2025 with, you know, all their cars having a plug or a plug type option and just a lot happening. So even in the, in the short term, you know, 2025 is not that far away. Um, I believe the projections are around 25% overall from a car sales perspective. So a lot happening in this space. And, um, you know, here in New York, municipalities have really been leaders from uh, EV adoption, um, like Jeff. So um, it's really exciting to see. Um, and as you can ma imagine, you know, it's, you know, it's really a, a paradigm shift from, from fueling, from what we kind of grew up knowing. You know, it's no longer run your gas tank, da gas tank down, go to a gas station and fill up. It's more of a, a top-off model, kind of like what you do with your cell phone. Um, although the charging depots and hubs and the gas, type, a gas station type Sphere will be coming as we're building these out at you know service stations and things of that nature. But the the majority of the market, as, as Jeff mentioned, you know you know ninety percent of it happens at home or in the workplace, and the rest is you know as you're as you're charging around town. And it really is that top off model. You leave your home with a full charge. You go to work. Chances are your employer may have a charging station now. You charge up there. You drive home. You take a trip. And it's just that that top off model. Um, and, uh, and people are getting used to that and adapting to that. It's also a very exciting time from an incentives uh, standpoint. You know, as a, as a municipality, the tax credit pieces uh, might not directly impact you, but it's certainly helping, you know, that maybe the private entities that can use that around you, you know, putting stations in, you know, but there's, you know, there's, you know, there's federal tax credits, there's state tax credits in New York. Um, there's rebates through, you know, like through NYSERDA, for example, um, which, which they'll touch on. Um, so there's great incentives there. And, you know, Jeff gave a great example of how he leveraged that. And then uh, also there's going to be, you know, utility make ready programs um, like Jeff's. There was the National Grid program that was recently or currently available. It's still, it's still in play, but there's going to be some, some other opportunities coming um, 
and some of you may have heard this about a month ago or so, the PSC in New York, you know, has announced uh, make ready programs across all of the utilities that, that they govern essentially, and could be up to 90% um, coverage for, for municipalities um, and public facing charging um, around the state. Again, it's a new announcement, still working through some of the details of the order, but this is, this is happening. So like how Jeff was able to take advantage of it with, um, with uh, you know, leveraging and stacking programs like NYSER and a Make Ready program, uh, there, there will be an opportunity to do that again. Again, it's a work in progress. This is a new release, so a lot's happening, but you know, happy to consult on that, that and how to you know, best leverage those two programs. Um, to give a snapshot for, from, from the current market here in New York, you know, we're north of 20, uh, 44,000 um, stations, or not, I'm sorry, not stations, uh, 44,000 vehicles um, within the market. Uh, when I started, I've been here just about five years now, or just over five years. It was around like less than 16,000 vehicles when we first started. So it's, you know, exciting for, you know, the market and me to see, you know, that how, how growth has been, you know, 45% year over year. Um, there's about 5,700 total commercial stations uh, in New York, uh, with ChargePoint being about 4,100 of those um, with, with some, you know, and that's a moving target, you know, stations are getting installed every day. Um, and I touched on these incentives uh, available, you know, in New York right now, between the state's tax credits, the Make Ready programs, and from time to time, the, the DEC in New York has some municipal uh, grants available. Um, most recent round uh, applications were due May 22nd. Not sure if any of you took advantage of that, but you know there are some great programs through the DEC as well. Um, also, another opportunity within the state that, that benefits you, um, in addition to grants and incentives, are there is um, a New York State OGS contract from a procurement standpoint um, that you're able to, to leverage. Um, which they have piggybacked on a source wall contract. So we're, we're on that contract and, you know, there's, you know, that's a good opportunity as well. Uh, if there's any questions on that, you can feel free to reach out to me or, or OGS directly. So now I'm going to touch on, you know, when thinking or considering of building out an electric vehicle charging program, just things to, to consider, you know, amongst uh, the team. One key area is aligning the priorities and planning to build for the future because, you know, EV is coming, uh, delivering a great user experience. And user really comes in two parts. One is station owners. So, so you as a municipality owning and operating these stations, but then also the driver experience and having the right station and network features and capabilities to ensure, you know, a, a great experience. Um, and then ultimately selecting a partner that's, that's able to sc scale with you um, and that's not just adding more stations, but needs change, you know, whether it's workplace charging, public charging, fleet, fleet's really big in the municipal space, the conversion of fleet vehicles because of the cost of ownership of those vehicles being so much, so, um, a lot of value there. So uh, anyway, part, selecting a partner that, that's able to scale with you as, as you continue to grow. So aligning priorities. So one is engaging, you know, all of your stakeholders. So EVs kind of unique where it impacts a lot of different departments within an entity, whether it's a government municipality or private or whatever it may be. You know, there's folks that are focusing on sustainability initiatives. You have your facility managers and, and fleet managers that are going to care about this. And then if there's a, a workplace, meaning employees of the municipality looking to have stations for, for when they drive to, to work at the building that they work in, there's, there's, there's an HR component. Um, and there's others than this, but these are some of the key ones that are usually involved. Um, and then you have your, your finance folks and those controlling the budgets and all that. But, um, you know, so there's a lot of stakeholders. So making sure you're aligning with them and pulling them in early just to make sure everyone's goals and objectives are being met because a sustainability person is going to care about one thing, but a, a fleet manager is going to care about that fleet operation. So kind of pulling everyone in to get their thoughts so that when you roll this out, um, leveraging networking and, and features and how you configure the software component you can manage multiple applications, types of applications from a single station and, and manage that all through software. And then also clarifying where your funding's coming from. Is there some existing budget that this was budgeted for? Are there incentives coming out? How do you leverage those incentives? And, you know, and you know, what's your, what's your short-term goal? What do you need to do today? And then how do you plan for what's coming by 2025 and scaling up? And the more planning you do early on, will certainly uh, save you significantly on, on some of those install costs uh, down the road if you can plan for it uh, early. Um, uh, delivering the great experience here. So it's really defining who's going to be using the stations. So 
Is it going to be employees of the municipality themselves? Is it going to be residents, meaning part, you know, in a um, um, similar to like a, you know some just applications where it could be used by local local um, local workers or residents of the community and and things of that nature. Other drivers, public charging, you know, the fleet piece. Finding out who's going to be using these stations and then designing the software component around that, meaning you know access controls if it's if it's designated for fleet, other access control, you know, setting access control so that nobody else can can use that station, or if it's designated for employees, or if it's only for public, or you know, mixed use type of applications, you can configure these stations to to recognize who authorized drivers are and things of that nature. So understanding who's using it allows you to set up the right the right features. Um, and Jeff touched on on some of the stuff from a pricing standpoint, but you know, if this is for for non municipal use, meaning you know fleets and things of that nature, you can set pricing at a station and Jeff did a good job touching on those. And during the question section, I can, I can answer some questions if there's anything specific on that. And then ultimately setting, you know, clear expectations when you roll this out. So through the networking capabilities in the app, you can clearly identify what the rules are or uh, explain what the rules and policies are of the station. It's very clear on, on, on our app to show what pricing is, if the station's available, if it's been in use, if there's other messaging, if you're trying to bring folks to your downtown areas, you can highlight some of the key key stores or, or, or um, restaurants or something in there too. So there, there is a, a marketing opportunity. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, you know, kind of engaging with the local community and um, those businesses to really have a team effort in that could be a, could be a nice thing to do. Um, if it's for internal use, like for employees, having a, a, a controlled way of rolling this out to employees so they understand what your rules and policies are. And, um, you know, EV drivers typically play nice at the station, but it's good to roll it out in a formal way. And then, um, and, I, and I, again, I can answer some questions on that at the end. And then ultimately selecting that partner that's able to, to scale with you. So, you know, the networking features, you know, are key to, to scalability because it gives you the data to understand what your costs are, what your revenue is, you know, to offset those costs. Um, how many different drivers are using your station on a, on, a, on a given day, month. There's a lot of data and you can break it up a couple different ways. Um, your energy consumption over time, you know, those types of things. Um, how long people are staying on the station so you can make sure your pricing policies are work because the, the key to running it efficiently is, you know, the more efficient you can run a station and have more drivers cycle on and off of it, the, the less stations you need to buy at the end of the day. So it, it saves you some costs there. Um, and that's part of, you know, my job and uh, or, or what partner you're looking at's job is to kind of help work through these things and develop, develop this plan. Energy management is key, especially as you start to scale, um, because it's not always necessary to have full power coming out of, of every plug, especially in the fleet space. I mean, there's clients that, that I worked with where if they were to just install a traditional, traditional power to every port, they would have only been able to put in nine plugs on an existing infrastructure, um, but leveraging our energy management, we we're actually able to oversubscribe it four to one. So with the same electrical capacity, we actually put in, um, you know, over 30 ports. Um, and it, you know, so that saves significantly on the, the installation costs. Um, that's not going to be appropriate in every application. So that's where really understanding the use case and then determining, you know, the best way to deploy these stations. There's a lot, you know, we're talking, you know, thousands of dollars of, of savings by, by doing it right. And then your ongoing driver support. So, you know, at least from a charge point perspective, we have 24 seven driver support. So at any point, you know, drivers can call us if they're new to the station or there's an issue or whatever the case may be, you know, it's ongoing driver support to really ensure that that great driver, driver experience. And, and it kind of takes that off your plate as well as, as station owners. And then that ongoing support, you know, there are option, optional, you know, maintenance and, and service plans out there. Um, you know, charge point, we do have a parts and labor type warranty with SLAs and uptime guarantees and all that. But, you know, it's really up to you on how you want to go about it. But there are plans out there to help with that support and monitoring of the station if you just don't have the capabilities to, to manage that in house or don't want to. Um, and then lastly, here on this point is um, expertise with managing these incentives, you know, in, in New York, I mean, we're doing this nationally, there's programs happening all over the country. Um, that we're part of. So we have a lot of experience and teams designated to this. Um, and we have great partners out there that we work with that are also great at this um, because these incentives are coming and there's future ones coming and we're typically have our, our finger on the pulse of what's what's coming out there. So kind of planning 
or if you're looking to do stations today, here's what's available to you. Let's help map this out and see which ones you can take advantage of and, and support you there. But then also have a sense of what's coming out in the next 12 months, maybe beyond to help, help with, with future planning. So having a partner that understands how grants and rebates work and is able to, to stack them and keep projects moving along so that you can have as much success as, as Jeff did with, with his program. All right, so choosing a station, and um, there might be some questions on this at the end, which I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Um, and Jeff touched on a little bit of this, but just this, just to give you an example, the one on the left would be kind of a traditional level two dual port charger, meaning it could charge two vehicles at the same time. Uh, the station on, uh, on the right would be an example of a DC fast charger. Um, this is a little over a 60 kW charger. So you know, a lot of times think, people think, you know, a faster charger is better. Um, that's not always the case. Um, there is a specific kind of use case for the, for the DC fast chargers. You see them a lot in the, in the fleet space or where dwell time is short. So along service stations, rest stops, things of that nature, maybe a valet parking type setting um, or curbside charging where you're, you know, some place where people are only going to be there 15, 20 minutes. But the majority of the application level two is still going to be what's appropriate because dwell times are longer at a workplace, for example. You're there eight, nine hours a day, maybe longer, you know, so you don't need to charge up in 15, 20 minutes, you know, an hour or two is fine. And, uh, you know, we have access, we're doing millions of sessions a, a month um, in, uh, um, you know, probably over 2 million charging sessions a month now. Um, so it gives us access to a lot of data and across that data set, you know, the average person on a level two charger is typically done, you know, in say two to three hours. So and if you're working for, for eight hours, that's plenty of time, multiple drivers can use that station um, throughout that day. So anyway, just something to, to consider is that level two is typically appropriate when dwell times are longer, overnight fleet charging, workplace, which I already touched on, even in a downtown setting, because typically if people are coming in downtown, you have it in a public municipal lot, they're going to spend an hour shopping, going to a restaurant, things of that nature. They get, they get an alert once their car is fully charged and notified. So, you know, and, and um, you can even set up like a reservation queuing type system so that it lets them know if someone's waiting for the station and you know it's all really managed you know through the apps and uh and networks that are that are available out there so um so that's that so just some some key points to consider depending on what your what your application is if it's a, a longer dwell time uh, dwell time type of environment you know level two is going to be totally fine to meet your needs if you, if you need a quick turnaround and from a municipal side in my experience it's primarily been on the fleet side, or if there's some initiatives to, if you're near a corridor, like a, a major highway or something like that, and want to be part of um, like a, a DC charging hub and kind of having some sustainability initiatives that kind of help support those types of goals um, to help drivers out and uh, kind of, you know, build those programs out. And sometimes it's partnering with local businesses to build out those, but that's a whole separate conversation. So again, the, the charging, a lot of this I already touched on, um, but the value of, of having, you know, network station is, is that data piece, having the data available at your fingertips easily so you know how to scale most cost effectively, the waitlist feature to manage your utilization, the energy management to, to um, save costs on, on um, you know, for maybe an unnecessary expense on the, on the installation side. Um, and this can all be implemented later because, you know, your needs are going to change as you scale and, and um, as your use case may evolve from just public charging to workplace fleet and, and all of the above, you know, flexible pricing, you know, so ability to charge for energy, for time, a combo of the two, you know, there's so much flexibility in, in how you set that up, access controls um, and APIs at the end there, um, because especially in the fleet space or, or some other types, there's, there's already programs existing that you, you may be using. So have, being able to integrate with other software platforms that you have to have a, a, a better experience from a fleet operator standpoint or whatever the case may be, we're able to do a lot of a lot of integrations. And again, we have teams that are here to help support and do these evaluations for you and, and come come up with uh, the right solution that'll meet your needs. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to show a couple examples of, of actual stations. Um, this is actually the city of Schenectady. Um, this is a, a curbside deployment that they have charging up two vehicles. Uh, BMW scooter there, as well as uh, um, an i3. Um, and I was actually, this was me taking the picture from an event I was there at when, after, shortly after this was installed um, a few years ago. Um, this is a very common, like, workplace type of application. Again, they charge 
you know, two vehicles at a time. So they're installed between two spots. There's wall mounted options there are all single port options. A dual port is going to be your most cost effective approach. Um, having protective bollards installed in front of them is also sometimes a good idea or wheel stops to prevent, you know, potential somebody driving into them. But um, that's totally up to you. We do recommend that though as a, as a best practice. Um, I like this picture because it just shows a different way to install them when there's a when there's an island like that you can install you know so you can charge um, cars on both sides of the island depending on your parking lot setup that might make sense um, and these are an example of a solar carport um, with a partner of ours we have uh, Envision Solar you know that's their design we're just a, a part of their solution so you see our charging station there um, running off of a, a battery that's charged up by the solar array charging up a, a bunch of vehicles in New York City. So um, again, yep, I'm here for any questions that you may have. Uh, here's my contact information. That's my cell phone number and uh, my email address. If you have any other questions, you know, or that we don't address on, on today's um, presentation, I'm, I'm happy to happy to help whatever. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, still no no questions in the the question box right now uh, but again I, I've got a couple on you that I, I thought were kind of some interesting points you made definitely on the the paradigm shift of kind of the fueling model that we have now versus a, an electric charging I mean to me I, I see that as one of the the big uh, kind of hindrances of, of EV adoption where folks are you know even you you might look at the the all electric range of a vehicle and think oh that like i can go farther than that on my gas vehicle i i can't get away with something that's less but in reality you're you're always full um or close to it on an electric vehicle outside of the, those long kind of interregional trips uh do you i mean have you seen anything that's kind of a uh you know something that's I mean, obviously outreach and education, but anything in particular that's going to help people kind of get away from that, uh, you know, go till I'm empty and, and gas up model. Like, yeah, you know, other mean, than driving an electric vehicle, I, I feel like it might be difficult to understand that until you're actually in one. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so, yeah, the, it's always constant, constant outreach. You know, it, the market's evolved a lot in the five years that I've been here, but still with some folks, it's still brand new. So some of the conversations are the same today that I had five years ago. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting market that way where some are, I've been doing this for years, some it's still brand new. So I think that the education piece is always gonna be there. Um, as a municipality, just as some thoughts of what I've done with, with other municipalities um, uh, around, you know, New York, New Jersey, um, our, our ride and drive events when, when we can all be around each other again, you know, in a different different environment, um, partnering up with the auto manufacturers or local dealerships that also shows a lot of support within the communities. Um, I've coordinated a lot of those. I've had some recent dealerships reach out to me to see if there's anything else coming up. So it's kind of good for the community, especially if that dealer is in your town, you know, and getting, and, and you can have these hosted at local workplaces. So I've done a lot of that too, where you have um, you know ride and drive events at at the employer's location. It gets people that maybe never considered buying an electric vehicle into one and driving it and seeing how how great they actually are and and all that. And and a lot of that is while they're test driving and stuff. There's a lot of conversation and education around it. So that's that's the suggestion that I've seen very successful. Um, a lot of municipalities have also during um, National Drive Electric Week, um, which is in uh, early uh, early September doing an events like that whole week, there's there's events happening all around and many of you might be already familiar with that, but that's another great way to show outreach in a community, kind of blocking off a piece of the downtown or partnering with a local building, but those those hop up, pop up um, and that's a, that's a pretty exciting week for the industry, but just again, a great great way to, you know, get the word out and messaging and stuff. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but those were just some suggestions, but certainly the outreach and continued discussions. Yeah, definitely. And actually, National Drive Electric Week, it's coming up. It's the end of September. So I, yeah. I think... Oh, yeah, we're in September already. Yeah. The, the yeah. 26th, um, it starts. And actually, I'm um, the coalition should be putting out some uh, some videos on some virtual ride-in drives and, and some content on, on electric vehicles. So anyone on the call, keep an eye out for that. Um, do have another uh, question for you in the chat box, Ryan. Uh, will you be switching to a credit card payment arrangement? Uh, I guess that's specific to ChargePoint. So, so the stations themselves, um, 
typically is like when people create a, a, a download or create an account with us, which is all free to do download our app. Part of that is uploading a credit card and transactions are managed that way. So the majority of the market is, you know, we have RFID or key fob, which links to your account that you could hold up to the station. But the way technology is right now, the majority have what's called tap to charge. We actually just hold your phone up to the, um, up to the charging station and the, the transaction happens that way. Um, and you know, there's some other contact lists and things of that nature, but there's a couple different ways to use a credit card. Um, and you do not have to have an account with ChargePoint to be able to use one of our charging stations. Sometimes that question comes up because sometimes people are new at this or they just like, like charging at home and they don't think they're going to need one, but then all of a sudden they realize they need to charge and never create an account. So you are able to use one of our stations if you don't have an account with us. That's one of the benefits of having a 24 seven driver support um, uh, there to, to assist with that and enable a station for you. That's great. Um, and I actually had one more question uh, for you kind of on the municipal side of things. And, you know, we talked about the, the level two versus DC fast. I mean, have you seen many instances where municipalities are, are installing DC fast for kind of the public facing stations? Um, yes, some, so, you know, some are, some are starting to do that. And, you know, there's, there've been, um, you know, there's different programs out there that, that can enable that. Um, in my personal experience, a lot of the municipalities that I've worked with that have done it, it's been a lot more on the, on the fleet side, but I am working with some right now. Um, and I, I cover New Jersey and New York, um, but I am working with some municipalities right now that are looking at putting in, you know, DC hubs and, and things of that nature. Yep. Um, I have a quick question for you too, if I could, Ryan, um, sort of at the other end of that <laughs> spectrum. Do you guys uh, have any, I mean, can you offer like any kind of value proposition for installing level one chargers, like in any kind of volume? And, and more specifically, I'm thinking, you know, we're in the process of designing a new parking garage. And I'm thinking it's like a 500, you know, space garage. I'm thinking we need as many as 50 stations. But I'm wondering in many cases, if these are people who live downtown and want to reserve a space, you know, is there any, is there any value to us or them of saying, you know, we could put in 30 level one stations that you could reserve as your own sort of garage station, so to speak. Yeah, so that my recommendation would to still to be to consider level two charger with, with a networking component, but leveraging an energy management capability to dial back the power to what you need because having access to that data and being able to control it and um, if you wanted to charge a fee or, or, or have some level of access controls, because with, with level one, you're, you're not going to have any control or data to really leverage to plan for anything else. So my, my suggestion if, to save on costs is if, if a much slower charge like that is really all you need is to deploy level two and, and work with, you know, we, Speaking from a charge point perspective, we have a team of engineers that can help you plan for that based on your capacity of what you have there, everything else, what your need's going to be, how much to, to oversubscribe or dial back that power to accommodate what you're looking for, but still gives you that data component. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, and actually, our third presenter, Jason from NYSERDA, has emailed me and said that he's caught on a call uh, for probably another 10 minutes. So I've, I can pull up uh, my presentation from yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon um, and kind of go over uh, kind of the, the, an, intro, an intro to the Clean Cities Coalition again and, and some of the work that we've done that kind of brought us to this point um, on the, the municipal EV readiness side of things. So uh, if you give me a second, I'll, I'll pull that up and um, go over that again here quickly uh, while we wait for Jason and NYSERDA. So, uh, I guess for any of you who weren't on the call yesterday, um, I gave a, a brief introduction to kind of the Clean Communities Coalition um, 
and you know how we're situated uh, within the MPO um, at CDTC. So I'm going to go over that quickly and then kind of jump uh, to uh, the work that we've done on our on our zero emission vehicle plan that kind of led us to this point. Uh, so what is Clean Cities? Um, Clean Cities Coalition. Uh, we're uh, uh, it's a U.S. Department of Energy program uh, that's really based on local public-private partnerships uh, that, you know, the individual coalitions establish with uh, the stakeholders in their region. Uh, the goal uh, that we have as coalitions uh, are to reduce petroleum consumption, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce our dependence on uh, imported petroleum products. And when I say our, uh, speaking for the United States. So this is a, a national program uh, funded with federal dollars. So, um, you know, it's really looking for, uh, you know, uh, the sustainability and, and resiliency of the United States kind of uh, fuel sources. So, um, and how it works, if, if you aren't familiar, is uh, we're hosted, the coalition is hosted within uh, the Capital District Transportation Committee, uh, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Albany, Schenectady, uh, Troy, and Saratoga Springs metropolitan areas. Um, so what that encompasses is basically the four county uh, capital region of Saratoga, Schenectady, Albany, and Rensselaer counties. Uh, and that encompasses 77 different local municipalities, including eight cities. Um, and really the, the main, uh, main focus of the Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, is to uh, program federal transportation dollars uh, uh, to local construction projects. So, uh, you know, we, we use our, our planning and programming process uh, really the three major products that we produce are uh, the long range transportation plan, uh, which is a, uh, a vision document with a 20 to 30 year horizon um, that's really establishing uh, the investment uh, goals and principles uh, for the region, um, you know, laying out uh, kind of the, the steps that we need to take uh, to reach a certain goal in uh, that future year. And uh, we actually just updated our um, long range plan, uh, New Visions 2050. Uh, uh, quite interesting document if you guys want to take a look on our website. Uh, another piece uh, uh, of work that the MPO produces, uh, really kind of maybe the major one that many of you on the call are familiar with is the Transportation Improvement Program, uh, which is our, our five year capital program of projects. Um, of funded, federally funded transportation projects in the region. So uh, projects that will be built uh, over the next five years in the region with federal transportation dollars. Uh, we also have a, a unified planning work program, which is essentially just our budget document uh, uh, that outlines all of the work we do and the budgets for each of those. Um, I'm gonna quickly skip ahead, uh, as I mentioned really, uh, the Clean Cities coalitions are, are really based on uh, that partnership between uh, public and private local stakeholders. Um, and really we want to, we work to connect our stakeholders um, with each other, uh, pot other potential fleets that are looking to adopt alternative fuels um, um, or the uh, kind of industry partners that are needed um, to help them with that, whether that's infrastructure, uh, providers or installers um, or vehicle manufacturers, um, anybody really as a liaison uh, to put interested uh, public and private fleets um, in connection with uh, the partners that are going to help facilitate that uh, adoption of alternative fuels. Um, as I mentioned, national coalition, um, there's over nearly a hundred uh, coalitions nationwide uh, that we as coordinators and coalitions have access to to kind of pick their brain um, and really get to leverage that information from uh, other coalitions uh, throughout the nation and as well as, you know, particularly in, in the Northeastern region, uh, you know, we coordinate with other coalitions a lot to, uh, you know, host and organize events and, and get a feel for, for um, you know, what types of alternative fuels 
um, are working kind of in the Northeast. Um, quickly, you know, what we do in, in particular, one of the plans that kind of led us here uh, to the municipal EV readiness web webinar um, is our capital district zero emission vehicle plan. Um, which there was an initial plan uh, developed the Capital District Electric Vehicle Charging Station Plan, uh, which the coalition worked on and released in uh, 2016. And uh, in 2019, uh, we updated the plan to kind of uh, reassess the region's EV readiness, uh, take a look at, you know, kind of some advancements that have been made in, in electric vehicle and zero emission vehicle technology, which um, essentially, in that case, we added some, some language on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, as well as electric bikes and electric scooters. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of came up with a number of uh, uh, takeaways from that document. Uh, really, you know, quickly just electric vehicles and, and charging station on the road. Um, or electric vehicles on the road and charging stations in the capital district have seen a significant increase over the past 10 years. Um, which we can uh, kind of credit to a number of things. Um, uh, you know, uh, some of which being, uh, you know, the, the continued New York State support through incentives um, and policy that's uh, supporting the growth of electric vehicles. Um, and so with that, you know, we kind of also touched on quickly in the document, um, you know, some of those New York State initiatives um, that are going to con continue to kind of push electric vehicles forward in the future. Um, you know, 100% zero emission electricity by 2040. Uh, you know, that's painting a great picture for uh, the progress of electric vehicles in the future um, to help push us towards those overall uh, emissions goals. Um, also quickly, you know, we looked at, you know, the uh, New York State has released some kind of high level uh, goals for electric vehicles and charging stations. Um, you know, 10,000 EV charging stations by 2021. Um, I think the number is, is somewhere just over 4,000 right now. Um, and 850,000 zero emission vehicles by 2025. And I, I think we're looking at around 50,000 uh, registered EVs today. So, um, you know, we're making great progress, but still have a long ways to go, uh, which is actually a great opportunity for electric vehicles and why, you know, we as a coalition try to continue doing these events um, and putting our stakeholders uh, in connection with uh, really the industry experts that we have on the call today. Um, and so out of that document, uh, you know, some barriers and opportunities were identified. One of those opportunities being municipal EV readiness. Um, you know, and, and in particular, we felt that, you know, municipalities have a, uh, a big role to play in this because not only do they have their own fleets uh, that they can electrify um, and provide infrastructure for, uh, but also they have the tools in their uh, zoning and, and, and development codes that uh, can kind of outline and, and prescribe uh, the future for uh, additional infrastructure uh, within the municipality. And then really with that kind of, uh, you know, make electric vehicles and the infrastructure uh, more apparent to the residents um, and, uh, you know, ideally continue to uh, facilitate that adoption uh, locally. And, you know, ideally when we have uh, multiple municipalities, especially within the region that can do this, uh, you know, kind of spur the growth for electric vehicles uh, statewide. Um, so that's what brought, um, you know, brought us to kind of organizing this event um, and hosting. And, you know, with that, I, I see Jason uh, on the line right now. Um, if anybody has any questions for me, I, I'd be willing to, uh, to answer those right now. I do see uh, none in the chat pod at this moment, but uh, you know, again, be willing to answer any questions that anybody on the call might have on the coalition um, or the MPO. Um, you know, after Jason's presentation, or um, you know, feel free to email me uh, at any time. Uh, so I'm not seeing uh, any questions right now. Uh, 
Jason, or uh, I see I'm you on the call. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got a, a, a quick intro for Jason if uh, you wanna share your screen um, and get started. Uh, so Jason uh, is with us from NYSERDA and he's gonna uh, talk briefly on kind of the, the New York State incentive opportunities, uh, you know, that can help uh, uh, put the infrastructure and vehicles, uh, you know, in your hands as a municipality. Uh, Jason is a project manager for NYSERDA's Clean Transportation Group, overseeing electrical, electric vehicle initiatives, including utility interactions related to the electrification of transport, as well as EV outreach and education programs. He performs policy and market research on sector initiatives, including improving the business case for EV charging station infrastructure, as well as smart mobility programs. Jason earned a master's of public administration at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs with a concentration in clean energy policy. So Jason, uh, thanks for being here and uh, you're all set, go ahead. Of course, can you see the screen? I can. Great. Well, thanks everybody. Um, happy to be with you and, and to talk about the programs that uh, NYSERDA is either leading or is, is coordinating on with, with other state agencies. Um, we are one piece of a, a significant um, initiative, a significant push to, to achieve New York's uh, overall decarbonization goals, but specifically um, transportation decarbonization goals. And uh, today I'm going to take you through the suite of initiatives that are ongoing right now. And, and we can, um, if there are questions, we can cover some of the things that are coming in the, in the near term as well. So let's jump in. This is uh, a, a sort of high level on, on the EV agenda for, for New York State. And uh, one of the most um, uh, exciting pieces of news recently was uh, New York signing on to the medium and heavy duty ZEV MOU, which, um, you know, if, uh, if things are going to continue along the way in, in a positive direction with, with respect to rulemaking, um, then what we'd be expecting is, uh, you know, a ramp up in, in the requirements for fleets to, to procure, um, elect, you know, zero emission vehicles in the medium and heavy duty space, uh, starting in model in about five years and continuing on to be all new sales by 2050. New York is already a signatory to the light duty ZEV MOU and uh, a New York share of the, the target, the target of three point, roughly 3.3 million uh, light duty ZEVs by 2025 is, is uh, 850,000, which is about eight percent of the current vehicle, uh, light duty vehicle fleet in New York state of 10 million. Um, the infrastructure necessary to facilitate the, the ZEV target is, um, is probably an order of magnitude or two larger than where we are right now, but we have a near-term target of 10,000 EVSE by, by the end of 2021, and we're in the we're north of 5,000 now. <clears throat> um, and then there's a recent commitment to, uh, to an expansion of the fast charge network with, with 10 locations uh, in each uh, regional economic development council by the end of 2022. And some of the REDCs are, um, have very few uh, fast charging stations at this point. Um, uh, in terms of uh, what the dollar investments have been for for EVs thus far, the, there are. Um, I'm going to go into more detail on the NYSERDA administered programs in in later slides. But uh, some of the other activity in New York, there's, there's a 250 million dollar investment announced by NYPA, the New York Power Authority, and and their evolved New York program phase one is already building fast charge locations um, in their. Uh, across the corridors of New York State, there's a station, a 10 port station going into JFK, and then and then there are uh, the Evolve New York map uh, on on NYPA's website is um, gives you an indication of where uh, the next uh, all of the future stations are going to be. That's there's about 50 stations in the first tranche, each with four plugs, so 200 fast charge plugs at at 150 kilowatts per plug. Um, the 
uh, regulator, New York's regulator, just uh, announced a huge in, uh, investment in Make Ready, the charging infrastructure necessary to bring the electricity from the distribution system to the to the chargers, and that that covered public um, and uh, workplace and multi-unit uh, Make Ready. It does not cover residential Make Ready, but there's a substantial amount of um, investment available there for each of the uh, major um, New York utilities, and that allows the developers to to have those costs shouldered by by the Make Ready order and by you know sort of a socialization of those costs and not borne by the project itself. Um, and then of course uh, there's the roughly 120 million dollars that New York was allotted through its um, remedy, a uh, uh, portion of the remedy from the Volkswagen settlement, and we're using those dollars to fund a number of clean transportation objectives, and I can go into that a little bit later. Um, by 2040, all of the transit operators, the largest transit operators in New York will be running electric buses only, and that has a, a pathway towards reducing some of the uh, disproportionate harms in, in disadvantaged areas. So going into the, the numbers right now, we have um, 54, about 54,000 electric vehicles on the road today, and that's uh, the vast majority of which are light duty. There just isn't um, the model diversity or um, the set of offerings in the medium and heavy duty space quite yet, but there are an increasing number of vehicles available in the, in the light duty space, so 54,000, and that has been uh, a very positive story of, of excellent year over year growth until um, well, you know, COVID and the pandemic have certainly uh, slowed down some of the EV buying, but um, and car buying in general. Uh, but we have sort of the pathway to, to 850,000 requires um, continued diligence in in increasing that number. And then on the charging port side, there are uh, 4,900 level two ports and 627 fast charge ports. The the large majority of those are Tesla ports, so. We have a long way to go to make, um, you know, brand agnostic uh, fast charging a reality for for EV buyers. So in the charging station world, we have a number of programs that uh, make it easier for for the state to expand the charging infrastructure portfolio. Uh, first and foremost, of which is an ICERTA program called Charge Ready, and that allows for a four thousand um, dollar flat rebate per port, and it's really an eight thousand dollar uh, rebate because it requires the installation of a dual port charger, so two parts at four thousand dollars each, um, and that is a uh, a program that is not indexed to the cost of the uh, of construction development. So, nice if you meet the requirements of the program and you energize the site, NYSERDA supplies you with a four thousand dollar rebate if if you were able to um, construct the port at at lower than four thousand dollars, then you you pocket the difference. Um, the uh, New York State Tax and Finance provides 50% business tax credit, um, at least for another 18 months or so, of up to $5,000 per charging station, and that's net of the the charge ready money. So any of the reduction that you receive from charge ready, you, you can get a, a tax credit on 50% of the remaining cost. And that's not for home charging. The NIPA Evolve New York program I spoke about earlier, um, largely focused on fast charging, although they may do some level twos co-located at their fast charge locations. They may do some, some level two as well, but fundamentally a, a fast charge program. And I spoke too about the, the make ready order, um, which, which uh, puts the, the cost burden on the utility to, to cover the make ready costs. Going on to some of the programs in the car and truck space, uh, NYSERDA's Drive Clean Rebate Program is a $55 million capitalization and provides, uh, depending on the electric range of the vehicle, the, the greater the battery size, the, the greater the, the rebate, up to $2,000 per vehicle. And that can be coupled with, um, in, you know, model dependent, the, what remains on the federal um, uh, EV tax incentive. The DEC, I'm uh, sorry, but, uh, the drive clean rebate is about two thirds um, committed. So there, there's still a considerable amount of money remaining for, for more EV purchases. And those are, uh, can be acquired for, for fleets and for commercial purposes as well as for um, private, private vehicles. 
Um, the DEC rebate is a, um, I actually just checked this and I think it's closed right now, but it is, I don't have, a, have any um, insight as to whether a next uh, round of that municipal rebate for, for EVs and, and one that's also on the charging station, uh, a rebate for, for municipalities for charging stations. They, they recently closed, I think earlier this summer and hopefully they will open again. The voucher incentive program is another NYSERDA program and, and this is funded uh, in part with um, some federal CMAQ money as well as some Volkswagen money. And I'm gonna get into details later, but this is a chance, this is an opportunity to take some uh, more heavily emitting uh, vehicles off the road and, and scrap them and replace them with um, newer um, alternative or zero emission vehicles, so alternative fuel vehicles and zero emission vehicles. And then some of the, the toll discounts that are made available through on the, um, through some of the bridges and tollways in New York provide some incentives um, for, for EV buyers and they also have access to some um, HOV lanes like on the Long Island Expressway. So I spoke uh, just a moment ago about the drive clean rebate. This is um, meant to be frictionless to the to the consumer. So the the dealer does the transaction with NYSERDA and passes the full the full uh, amount of the rebate to the to the consumer in the form of a lower purchase price, and then um, uh, completes the transaction by applying for the rebate to to NYSERDA. And as you can see in the table there, the the size of the um, rebate is indexed to the to the battery range of the car. And actually, I'm I'm going back and I'm looking at. I see that it's now it says 30 plus models, but this graphic is um, uh, should be updated because there are now uh, considerably more. Um, in terms of the truck voucher program, uh, similar similar um, mechanism to to distribute and, and deploy the the voucher. So so the end consumer ends up buying a, a lower cost vehicle. And the intent of the program is to um, collapse the incremental cost of the um, alternative fuel vehicle or the battery electric vehicle um, on top of what its counterpart uh, fossil fuel vehicle would be. And it covers um, a variable portion of that based on the vehicle technology and the weight class. And we can we can go into that later. The, the argument for the, the the BEVs and the and the alternative fuel vehicles is is quite compelling, cleaner, quieter, uh, lower operating costs. Um, that's a compelling value proposition. The challenge for some fleets is that uh, a 2009 or older diesel truck has to be removed, and that involves uh, drilling out a hole in the engine and um, and the chassis. So there's some very specific requirements uh, to comply with some of the funding sources. In terms of uh, what the truck and bus, um, what the truck voucher program covers, uh, it covers um, some port handling equipment, it, it covers um, school buses, it covers transit buses, it covers delivery vans, a, a whole suite of uh, vehicle types and weight classes. And it, there are a, a host of technologies that can be um, uh, taken advantage of in, in terms of the, the replacement vehicle. So that's, uh, uh, some quick remarks to, to set you up for um, more investigation, um, but I'm happy to take questions and um, uh, certainly can distribute the slides, uh, provided some links here for, for the programs that I mentioned. Um, this does, that does not include the NIPA Evolve New York program, but that's, uh, you know, it would be, it should be easy to find on the web. And uh, yeah, with that, I will open it up. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate the info. Um, still no questions in the chat box uh, as of now. Um, anyone feel free uh, to have any questions for Jason or any of the other panelists or myself. Um, we are quite a bit ahead of schedule here. Um, But um, if there are no other questions, um, we will just wrap up for today.
And so I'm, I'm still not seeing any questions come in. So um, we will go ahead and, and wrap up early here this afternoon. Um, I've got a, just a couple kind of closing comments uh, for the webinar. Uh, First off, we do have something in the in the chat box there from David Borton, uh, who mentions that uh, boats boats are a large off-road fossil burners, and uh, electric boats are 100% solar powered, uh, clean, quiet, and have no range anxiety. So, David, uh, thank you for attending. So, if anyone doesn't know, David um, builds 100% solar boats uh, right here in the Capital Region. So. Uh, longtime member of the coalition and, and always appreciate his input and uh, kind of interesting to know, uh, you know, both, so David and his, his uh, electric solar powered boats, uh, uh, there is also an, an E-Lion uh, showcase facility in Green Island, New York, um, which is uh, uh, an uh, heavy duty electric truck manufactured uh, based out of uh, Montreal. Uh, so just interesting notes, uh, there are kind of some uh, uh, electric vehicle companies with roots right here in the Capital District, um, uh, maybe to keep an eye on in the future. So um, interesting to touch on. Um, as a wrap up, I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, just a reminder that the, the webinar is recorded um, and it will be posted on our, our Capital District Clean Communities website. Um, hopefully get uh, you know, send an email out to the attendees list early next week. Uh, both days uh, webinars will be posted uh, as well as present, uh, presenter slides um, and uh, some other guidance documents as well that might be helpful to the municipalities. Um, uh, also, you'll be receiving a follow-up email, uh, I think tomorrow through the Zoom software uh, with any comments. Uh, or final chance to ask questions on the presentation. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And again, if anybody has uh, any questions uh, that might come up over the next few days, feel free to reach out to myself um, or any of the presenters uh, if you happen to grab their, uh, their contact info. I'm sure they'd be happy to work through any questions that you had. So um, with that, I uh, just wanted to say thanks again to all the panelists. Uh, uh, for some great presentations and, and quality information. Um, and thanks again to all the attendees that uh, have participated the past uh, two days. So uh, thanks again and uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks Jacob. Jacob.